Warning, the following podcast features views and opinions that are likely to trigger the extreme fanboys and fangirls who disagree with them. Listener discretion is advised. And we're back. Last week, we were in a galaxy far, far away, and today, we're going on the opposite side of the star coin. If Wars was last week, this week, we're on Trek. And joining me this time, uh, someone who has not been on the show yet, I'm very excited to have on the show, uh, besides Scott Mance, maybe one of the most hardcore Trekkies that I know, Clee Wiggins. Clee, welcome to the show. Thank you. I've been wanting to be on this show for so long. You've had Ed on so many times. It's I mean, just he has a lot of hot takes. But. I, I, Ed, I know what he's going to say before <laughs> he says it. So it's very easy to mentally prepare for what's coming at me. Yeah. No, but here's the thing. I've been following your social media posts for a long time since mm-hmm. you've been doing Star Trek rewatches. So I've been kind of getting to see how you feel about Trek in little snippets for, I feel like it's been yeah. like a couple months now at least. Yeah, well, because I'm doing the nerdiest thing possible, which is re-watching the entire show, like every series, every movie, by as close to as I can approximate, because there are some major gaps, by star date. So... Woof. Woof. That sounds... <laughs> It was like quarantine. <laughs> Besides, like cooking things I've never cooked before, which all look amazing, it, by the way. Yeah, is it's my quarantine project, and I've been doing most of my watching while I cook, um, because I've seen every episode of Star Trek and every movie multiple times, with the exception of maybe the Paramount Plus CBS All Access shows. I've actually only seen any of those once. I've never done a rewatch of any of those, but all of the original series series apostrophe and all of the original movies um and and all of the kelly movies i've seen at minimum all of them on average three to four times so but this is a lot of I feel them like, it's way more <laughs> i feel like this is important to before we get into like talking because today by the way we are talking about the star trek kelvin timeline trilogy yeah. that's 2009 star trek 2013 star trek into darkness 2016 star trek beyond but i think it's important to kind of know like where for you coming from like when did your love affair with star trek start because you don't watch stuff According to star date, unless this is something <laughs> like that's not just like a casual I think you should probably rewatch that. Like that is no. um, that is a mission. Also, yeah, it, it's multiple. I just I have to consult multiple websites. I've started a Excel spreadsheet, but it's not finished yet. That will list it all that I'm gonna eventually post on my social media. But it's it's a daunting like this is like it's a job it's a 40 hour a week job for at least a, two or three months and i don't have that kind of time but um my mom is a and my mom and actually all of her my mom has four sisters and all of them are star trek nerds like deep nerds like like my my aunt ingress had like her Apple iWatch face is a is a picture of the Enterprise D bridge. My <laughs> my aunt, all of my all five of my aunts had exact replicas of the Star Trek TNG com badges um, <laughs> that they bought each other for their birthdays one year in the nineties. <laughs> what a fun Thanksgiving! Everyone just clicking there. <laughs> and, and, and like it would, you could press like it was a magnet that you could put on, and then you would press it, and it would make a noise. They would watch Star Trek TNG um, every week at their at somebody's house because all of my aunts, um, we all they we all lived within maybe two or three blocks of each other, and three of my aunts actually lived in the same building as I as I grew up in in San Francisco, and then my other two aunts lived like down the street, basically. And so every week they would switch house. Every Sunday they would switch houses, and whoever's house they were at, that aunt's children would have to wait on them with coffee <laughs> and tea and cake while they watched Star Trek. And then, <laughs> like starting from the premiere in 1988, when I was like maybe ten, about ten years old, um, or 1987, I was ten when the when TNG premiered. And they like all got together. I think my mom's house was first and I had to make them cappuccino and tea. 
<laughs> and serve them cake that they bought. My aunt, one of my aunts brought a cake, and like they would just be like, quickly, another piece of cake, please. Or like, and, the, and then every commercial break, they would go, ooh, it was so bizarre. So <laughs> I'm surprised you don't like resent it then if you were the hired help. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like it was, and it switched houses every week, so I only had to do it at once a month. Um, except for my aunt, one of my aunts didn't have any kids, so then she would pay one of us like twenty bucks to go to her house when it was her week, and and do it at her house. That's so interesting. <laughs> so I would have to do it maybe every four to six weeks, but if I had to do it more than once in a month, that meant I made I got twenty bucks to do it, and I just started watching the show. But I watched like the original series. Um, <laughs> Like, just like kids like yeah i mowed some lawns babysitting <laughs> star trek waiting on people yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I, and I watched the original series like you know when it would come on in the afternoons you know when i was a kid like it would come on actually they used to do in the bay area for a while it would be buck rogers and star trek would come on like back to back on um tv 20 like it would be like buck rogers star trek buck rogers star trek for like a two hour block or wow. four hour block so, so I think it's safe to say this is not like a new thing for you. Star Trek no. very much and since at least it. age like eight or nine, I've been watching Star Trek. So I think for me, my, my story is, is quite different. I was a Star <laughs> Wars kid. I was very yeah. much Star Wars, not into the Trek. Then I saw a preview. It was December of 1998. Mm -hmm. And it was Star Trek Insurrection was coming in mm. theaters. I had never seen a Star Trek anything in my life. I was like, mm. ships, lasers. I like all those things. <laughs> Saw Star Trek Insurrection. It was a terrible movie that I what liked. What a weird introduction. It, right? It made no sense, I would think. It's, it was, it, I had no idea what was <laughs> happening, but I was just like, ooh, guns and, and space and stuff. And my dad was like, well, you should watch the good ones. And so that's mm -hmm. when I started getting into the original series. And I made my way back to Next Generation in my mm -hmm. own discoveries. But I was very much the original crew because that was something my dad wasn't really he's not into sci-fi or anything but for some mm -hmm. reason star trek is the outlier but man what a terrible time to fall in love with star trek i was in seventh grade which is oh, the <laughs> worst time to fall in love with star trek and it, you know it's 1998 going into 1999 so star wars is coming up again but my email address because that was new to me was spock86 at star trek mail.com <laughs> Dark. Oh I my know. god! I and knew it was, enough to hide it a little bit. <laughs> no, it was terrible, and of course I got picked on and made fun of. And I feel bad because my grandma at a uh, at a used bookstore found a copy, a first run copy of like the the uh, Wrath of Khan official movie novelization. She's like, "Here, you like Star Trek? This is cool." And I was like, "Yeah, this is cool." And I took it to school. Huge mistake. Got totally made fun of except one kid brandon it's like that looks really cool and i was just like shove it brandon i don't <laughs> want to hear it anymore and i regret it to this day because brandon, brandon was probably like totally trying been your to... best friend i know <laughs> and i just was so bitter so the reason why this is all important to me is because first we're going to talk about 2009's uh star trek directed by jj abrams and i feel like the thing about this movie was I was so excited when it came out, but I was a little bitter as well because this was the first Star Trek that was really made. I mean, you could make the argument yeah. uh, the voyage home was also very much for a broad audience, but Star Trek was basically like, you know, 2009 Star Trek was how can we make this for people that would never, ever go see a Star Trek movie? And yeah, they did. And they came yeah. and saw it. And they loved it. And I know this is gatekeeper-y attitude, but I was very mad in 2009. That's like, no, you don't get to like the thing that you made fun of me for 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Not fair. Uh, That's how I, I felt at the time. I, yeah, I was of the opposite opinion. I was so happy that they kind of made it for a broad audience. I mean, I've since learned that there are some reasons why they had to do it the way they did, um, which I guess we can get into. But I found it like when I'm, I remember when I saw the trailer for the first time, I was like, oh, good. Then I don't have to hide this anymore because I was also a Star Wars fan. I mean, I have a Star Wars tattoo and I don't have any Star Trek tattoos yet yeah but <laughs> but i mean and i was supposed to get one actually last year and then obviously we all know what happened last year so um but i i was actually very happy that like 
okay, because I, I, I'm of one of those people who was like, A, I never had any shame really behind my like nerd, like my, my nerd fandoms. Um, I, I put it out on full display. I had a, I had a Darth Vader Trapper Keeper all through school. Like I'm talking about from like fifth grade all the way to high school and even in college. So I never. But wouldn't you say that Star Wars, for whatever reason, was way more socially acceptable than but Star no, Trek? At the same time, but I always had Star Trek posters in my bedroom and in my dorm room at college. I had Star Trek, like I had a UGK and an Eight Ball and MJG poster, and then I had a Star Trek Generations poster, like right next to it, like in my dorm room in my freshman year. Of well, college. you had you had very healthy opinions. I <laughs> at, in two thousand nine had yet to really grow into the this stuff is for everyone because at the time I was annoyed. But in terms of the movie itself, this was really interesting because I rewatched this movie recently uh, and I was just thinking to myself, you know, this is the the beginning, the very beginning, our first time that we get to see all of these characters that we come to know and love. And I just kept thinking to myself, you know, other than getting Leonard Nimoy in here, was there a reason why this had to be an alternate timeline? Like this could have just been. Well, OK, so I have found. Oh, here we go. I have Okay. In so, Star Date. Uh... <laughs> no, this actually has nothing to do with creative <laughs> with creativity. It has everything to do with bullshit legality. So, because of the legal how the legal rights work for the Star Trek property, there was there's actually three Star Trek canon timelines. There's what they call the, the canon timeline, which is the original everything from the original series up through Enterprise, if we're going just by release dates, plus any movies, all the movies that are related to those properties. Then there's the prime timeline, which is all the CBS All Access slash Paramount Plus shows. And then there's the Kelvin Universe timeline. And the reason is, is that for whatever, I don't know exactly like all the machinations, but all of those have to be 25% or more different from each other in order to legally be released. So the Kelvin timeline movies, which are the first to come out after the so-called canon timeline, had to be 25% different from the canon timeline. Which So they, so they had to make it. So they had that's why they that's why they did the Kelvin timeline in the first place is so that they could completely retell the story of Kirk and how he becomes captain of the Enterprise without having to touch on any of the events that happened in the original series. The only thing that they could use were the characters that are appear in the original series, but they cannot use pretty much anything else. Like they can't use any major plot elements that develop or what we know of Kirk's life and what we know Spock's life. Right. Um, which is just like... <laughs> and then the okay, same thing with CBS sure. All Access has to be 25% different from both the canon timeline and the Kelvin timeline. So they're calling that the prime timeline. It's, prime time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's it's, it's just of, like such corporate. Into, yeah, it's corporate nonsense. And it has also like, and so it's created three alternate universes that are kind of in addition to the Mirror Universe and the Enterprise C Incursion universe, which are also two other timelines. And, and I, okay, so I'm glad you said all that because I think one of the 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 brilliance of 2009 Star Trek is that like none of that matters. It really mm -hmm. is like come to this and and it's clean of like you know watching a lot of Star Trek, you you kind of figure out real fast like yeah, there's a lot of like techno babble that. You you after a while you kind of get what they're trying to say. It doesn't. You're never going to follow it 100. percent This movie I feel like dispenses with a lot of the techno babble and just these are just people for the most part. Yeah. Like it's the most human story to me of most of these Star Trek things. Well, I think J.J. Abrams took that legal like press it or like that legal like constriction that he had and was like, all right then. And he's not. He's like a Star Trek like casual Star Trek fan, but not a huge fan like he was with Star Wars. And he took that and he was like, all right, then I'm going to take what I like, what kept me like a casual fan of Star Trek, which is like the character development, like even though as little as it is really, if you really rewatch the original like stories, the canon, the so-called canon stories, and then, and make it like, and then pump up the action and make it more interesting for somebody in 2009, 2008, 2010 or whatever to watch. So I kind of appreciated that 
Um, and especially so having since learned that he sort of constricted, he couldn't use too much. That I was like, well, I think it probably helped him in this case to have that kind of restraint or yeah, like that this, sort of shackle. There's this, this connotation, I think, sometimes with Star Trek that because of Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry, the creator's kind of vision of like, well, everyone's kind of happy and everyone loves each other. And we're really <laughs> going for more scientific things that, you know, whenever you try to introduce conflict, it didn't quite, that wasn't quite what he was going after. And there were a lot of Trek people that were not happy with 2009's Trek because it did feel more like a relevant of the time kind of like action movie that had Star Trek imagery around it rather than a Star Trek movie, which by that point, I feel like to me at least Star Trek had evolved so much with different iterations that I don't think you could pin it down to one thing anymore. Yeah, but I... Especially, like I would say, especially TNG almost feels like a fairy tale version. Like they're on the Federation flagship. Nothing can possibly happen to them because they're on the most important ship in the Star in Starfleet. So, but then you watch like DS9, where they're on the they're on the front lines of the Dominion War, or you watch Voyager, where they're stuck way the fuck out in the Delta Quadrant. Like that actually feels more like Star Trek. If you're gonna like harken it back to the original series, then TNG does. Even though TNG is probably my favorite of the series, uh, of all of the series, it's like a fairy tale version because nothing really bad ever totally happens. You know what I mean? It's like you you always know they're gonna get out of it. DS9 feels the most dangerous because they're they're facing an enemy that's like it's not the Borg or so single minded, and it's not like where they can sort of duck and dive because they're not in a starship. They're stuck on a station that is at the at the front lines of a huge battle. That's like at the, the rest of the Federation and that even brings in the Romulans. Yeah, so know? I think, you know, when you when you have And so these... I like the Kelvin universe because it sort of takes all of those elements right. um, of like, you know, there's like war and think like, and everybody's not happy. Like Benjamin Sisko was tortured by the death of his wife for years, Kirk is tortured by the death of his father, like up until he's like 25 years old. Right. And I, I, <laughs> I love that about Kirk. It's actually funny because, you know, having not watched the original series, maybe, I don't know. I think I did a rewatch maybe 10 years ago, five years mm -hmm. ago. Um, you know, you, you don't really get a lot about Kirk as a person in terms of like his father, because his father was still alive when he became a captain yeah. in that original timeline. I love the addition in this. It's like, let's make Kirk, you know, like if he's going to be this quote unquote bad boy of space, let's give him some pathos. Let's like give him some tragedy in yeah. his life. And sort but, of give him a reason for being such a like kind of a dick. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Somebody losing their parent young turns a lot of people into dicks. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think Batman is kind of a dick and yeah. uh, he lost his parents. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I, I love the relationship between him and Spock in this movie. I think when you think yeah. of Kirk and Spock, they're like the original bromance for, yeah. for a lot of people. So to come into this okay. movie and have them be butting heads and even by the end, it's like, uh, you know, they're, there's like a, a mutual respect, but they're not quite Kirk and Spock yet because you know mm -hmm. that there's more to come. Like, I thought that was a really cool choice that I really liked in this movie. I think Zachary Quinto was great as Spock. Yeah, I think the casting for the for the Star Trek reboot movies is pretty much perfect. You know what's interesting, though, mm -hmm. is that I feel like half of them, they're like, do your own thing. Like, mm -hmm. Uhura, Kirk, it's like, you don't have to try to be William Shatner. You don't have to try yeah. to be Nichelle Nichols. And then the other half of it is like, like Carl Urban, like do your best impression that you possibly well, yeah. can. Well, definitely Zachary Quinto and Carl Urban went with, we're going to like, not the, do, do the closest you can or play full homage to the original actor and their characterization of that character. And then Chris Pine sort of like rode the needle a little bit. And I think, um, and this, I feel like kind of, it could be a race thing. That's just because she's black was good enough, but that, <laughs> So Saldana did not have to like be Nichelle Nichols. <laughs> no, it's it's funny because they like and same expanded. thing with Don Cho as Yahura. But then um what's his name? Oh, so sad. Oh um, uh, Anton Yelkin. Anton Yelkin kind of also did the same thing. Like he probably did the most closest sort of impression 
Which was weird because he looked the least like the person he yeah. was doing the impression of. Like the only thing he had in common is that they're both Russian and they're both young. But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> there's um, nothing to say. But I, I do love that, like, you know, Ahura in these movies is such a great character and i love the yeah. choice that they that they made to pair her with spock mm -hmm. um i think that was just such a i i know that was another thing that like well, you were either on board with it or you weren't you know well here's the thing though if you watch the original series in in order even if you just watch it in air date order because the start date order doesn't make that much difference with the original series because they didn't the start dates were pretty like they, they were bullshit in the original series they they were all over the place um there is a flirtation between Spock and Yahura in the original series that you can only really catch if you watch it like multiple episodes back to back, fairly close together. Right. Like there is, there are longing looks, there are weird touches. I, I haven't found enough evidence like separate from watching it to say, but there is some like rumors that that was supposed to be a thing, but like that, um, CBS and the production companies shut it down of like Spock and Yurha ever becoming a thing until they decided to do the Kirk and um, Yurha kiss, which could have easily just as been like with, with Kirk and Yurha, I mean with Spock and Yurha. But there is a implied flirtation. Between but then Spock she shacks up with Scotty in the in the in the movies down the line, which is really weird because it's only yeah. for I feel like it's only in Final Frontier, and then they never talk about it again. Yeah, and I think that's just old people loneliness. <laughs> <laughs> we, I mean, Scotty, Scotty's got to he's got to have a girl, right? He he's yeah. he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Let's talk about well, Scotty because that was another character that I really loved in this, and I love that they kind of brought him in halfway through the movie. It wasn't like the crew's all here, let's go. Yeah. It was like you kind of have to assemble your crew a little bit. Well, yeah, and like, and if you look at the because I've been researching star dates like a jackass because I'm a nerd. <laughs> um, that in the Kelvin timeline, Kirk gets on the Enterprise five years sooner than he does in the original in the original timeline. So because in the original timeline, I think he doesn't get on the Enterprise or three years sooner. I think actually he doesn't get on the Enterprise until until 2255 in the original timeline. And in the Kelvin universe, it's 2252 or something like that. But um, Oh, no, I have that reversed, actually. It's three years later. But because he's not on the Enterprise in 2252, Scotty never joins the Enterprise because Scott, because supposedly Kirk is always meant to recruit Scotty to the Enterprise. Wow. Look, at you're just, I feel like I'm talking to the to the fandom Wikipedia page right <laughs> now. <laughs> it's, it's, and most of this knowledge really comes from my stupid quarantine project of watching these movies and shows. But that's kind of the starting. charm. That's the charm <laughs> of, of this first movie is like, that's that's a really cool fact. It has no bearing on this film. Yeah. So you can watch it and enjoy it just the no, same. It's like an Easter egg when you know that Kirk like goes to Starfleet in 2255 right. or 2252 originally and he doesn't join until 2255 in like in the Kelvin timeline because he doesn't have his father there to influence him to go to the academy sooner. There's so a couple of fun the academy little... when he's 19, he joins the right. academy when he's 22. Uh, there's a couple of fun little Easter eggs in there. There's, you know, they mentioned Admiral Archer's dog and, mm -hmm. you know, there's just like those little teeny bits that it's almost just yeah. like, I feel like that's the, they're talking to like the really hardcore Star Trek fans that they're like, I know you've heard this before, mm -hmm. but just give us one movie to get everyone else on board and then we'll, we'll give you some new stuff. But yeah. I, I, again, I think of the three movies, I like this one the best. I think it holds up the best. I think the yeah. humor really helps. I think the humor works in this movie that maybe it doesn't in some of the other installments of this franchise. Um, I yeah, think the, the second and third movies, they're okay. And I could see why people could hate them. Um, the second one suffered, also suffers from a lot of legality and production problems. Um, and the third one is just like, it just took the creative like right turn to the hard right. And you're just like, all right, you know what? Fine, it's okay, but you don't have to like even consider it as a thing. Let's the talk about. I, oh, I no, I was gonna like. say let's let's talk about Star Trek Into Darkness, the second mm -hmm. one, since you brought it up, because I do think like, you know, I think generally speaking, 2009 Star Trek, big box office success, and most people 
really, really enjoyed it. Of course, yeah. there's always going to be the outliers, but Star Trek was kind of like the, oh, like we didn't think that this was going to be such a success, but here we are. Star Trek Into Darkness comes out in 2013, and now you kind of have these expectations put on it. You have Benedict Cumberbatch coming in. We all know he's going to be Khan. I don't know how we all know, but we do all know, and they're being very coy about it. Uh, Alice well, at Eve first they were that. saying he wasn't going to be Khan, and right. by all accounts, he wasn't meant to be Khan. He was supposed to be a whole new character. Maybe an augment still, but not Khan. And then for whatever reason, some studio head was like, nope, he has to be Khan. We're going to do Khan. Khan it is. Which and is just so strange. Like, it's so look, stupid. I like this movie. I like this movie more than most people do. But I, there's nothing about the Khan thing. There's the moment where he's like, my name is Khan. Khan. And right, everyone, you know, like everyone in the audience is like, oh, but the characters, that means nothing to them at the time. Mm. That bothers me. That being said, so I saw this on opening night. And when mm. he's like, my name is Khan, everyone's mm. like, oh. And then when I saw it with my mom about a month later, my mom was like, oh, it's Khan. I know Khan. I know that one. And it's just like, okay, the general, my, I use my mother as like the general audience. Yeah. That's who that moment was for. And it's fun. It's fine. It doesn't detract from anything. So I think him being Khan is like fine, except it's just like, again, like, you know, we were talking about how, like, some of these actors they tried to find that looked at least remotely like the person. That well, there they was were being. supposedly like a big search for a Latino or South Asian actor to play Khan, and they landed on Benedict Cumberbatch. And then they like, and then the writing team was like, "No, we're not doing Khan. We're doing this other character who's not." Khan. So then they hired Benedict Cumberbatch and then the studio came back later and was like nope, we're doing Khan. And so now it has to be Khan, but they've already hired Benedict Cumberbatch and paid him a bunch of money and it was like, well, we can't not hire, we can't not have Benedict Cumberbatch anymore. It's just bizarre <laughs> because it's just like Benedict Cumberbatch is an amazing actor, but yeah, and so I heard all kind of casting rumors. It was supposed to be Benicio. Um, I heard yeah, and like the dude who was on. Oh God, he's so hot. I forget his name, but there was like this Latino actor. He was kind of really big at the time. He had just come off like a sitcom or whatever. Uh, it's gonna come to me. I don't know. I should have looked it up before I talked to you. But who's supposed uh, to be Khan? I have um, no idea. But no, there, are, okay. there, are very, there are lots of sexy, big uh, yeah. Latinos that could have filled that role. And they had like, yeah, and they had a bunch of Southeast Asian actors they were considering who were like un unknowns even. Right. And like that would have been like a great, like for the right actor, an unknown could have pulled it off. Well, it's just Benedict Cumberbatch. Like, I, I mean, absolutely no offense. He's like so I scrawny. He's so scrawny compared to what Ricardo Montalban, whose boobies were popping out of that yeah, little that was robe. A, wasn't that Prosthetic. I don't I've, think so. I think I've his boobies heard, were were hundred percent real. <laughs> I've always heard it was a prosthetic. I I'm I'm gonna believe until <laughs> because I need something to believe in in 2021 <laughs> until I get my yeah. vaccine. I'm gonna believe in <laughs> that those boobies were real and that Ricardo Montalban just had it. Um, there was an interesting thing again, like I said, you know, watching these movies again in preparation for this. I don't know if this was intentional or if this is just something that I kind of read into it, but there's this interesting kind of motif in this movie of, okay, so we've established these characters and we know from the history of the TV show and everything, we know how these characters are supposed to be, how mm -hmm. they're supposed to act. And it's like this movie kind of dismantles that character by character where it's just like, you know, I think, you know, the perfect example, like, is like Scotty. We know that Scotty's just the yes man who's going to get it done for you. Mm -hmm. And Scotty's just like, no, I'm not going to do that. This is wrong. and I'm not going to do it. And he quits. You know, mm -hmm. there's uh, for a lot of these characters who are, it's almost like they are acting against how we perceive that character is supposed to be. And I could see that as kind of like a betrayal of the character. But for me, I kind of see it as an interesting kind of like dynamic that's what makes this movie kind of interesting is like everything's a little bit reversed these characters are not acting the way that you expect them to it's new it's different 
Yeah, I mean, like this, that movie, Into Darkness, was all about sort of flipping a couple of expectations, like Spock, uh, like Kirk dying instead of Spock, and and Scotty sort of like not being the miracle worker and not wanting to follow orders, and or you know, and following Kirk into whatever oblivion he leads them into. He's like, no, I'm not doing that. I don't trust it. But but at the same time, it's still, I think it still keeps within the parameters of who those characters are because sure. Scotty is a brilliant engineer and he would be like man these torpedoes are suspect as f i'm not f with them i think it's bullshit i think you should all say like no and it's just that nobody follows him because he's not the leader i think that kirk would easily have sacrificed himself for spock in the original wrath of khan movie you know if, it, if the if the situation had been reversed kirk would have done the exact same thing that spock did so I, I feel like it's still in keeping within the parameters of the character while flipping a little bit of the like sort of superficial expectations of what we have with those characters. Definitely. And I don't, I don't think it's like completely out of bounds. I think it's just interesting too, or it's like Spock is this character who pretty much between both Kirk and Uhura is like, guys, you know, I am how I am. I don't know why you're upset that I would, you know, like turn you in or narc on us what we did. Like, that's mm -hmm. what I do. I'm Spock. Or I don't know why you'd be upset at her. Like, of course, I'm going to do this like crazy dangerous thing. Like, that's what I do. Why are you getting yeah. upset with me? Like, it was very interesting. Like, it was a, almost like a meta commentary on, on the identity of these characters in a certain mm -hmm. way. A little uh, look. There is no defending the the magic blood at the end. It may be the worst ending of a Star Trek movie. It's stupid none. and cheesy. It's so bad. It's done really badly too. Yeah. Like no offense, Carl. But, 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 but is it any cheesier than the entirety of Search for Spock? <laughs> I like Search for Spock. <laughs> um <laughs> I have had yes. enough of you. And then he kicks him off. That's great. But no, but like his car is in McCoy and McCoy's half McCoy and half Spock. But they got to go find Spock's body. He's a child, but he's not a child. Like it's certainly <laughs> more, I'd say into darkness, like the convenience, like Carl Urban trying to sell how depressed he is. And then this like thing comes back to this triple thing comes back to life with mm -hmm. magic blood. It's just like, guys, come on. Like it's almost like you guys got to the to the very end of the movie. You're like, we don't know how to end this thing. Like, we know we have to undo well, this. Well, I think it got to the end of the movie, and we're like, we're not going to do a whole movie about how we bring Kirk back to life. So, because nobody wants to see that, so we have to do it in three scenes or less. And they did. <laughs> it's just like you, if you have magic blood like that, it's like so irresponsible now that everything I think, in the world. I feel like fix. there's a shit ton of deleted scenes about about uh mccoy experimenting on this tribble and kind of knowing this part and then they took uh, there's a bunch of different like shoot shots of him either like working on the tribble and knowing it's got magic blood or him just figuring it out because the tribble comes back to life and he's all like mm. and like they went with that one because it was the most succinct i, I feel like that has to happen because the, the alternative is is to do star trek Three, the search for Spock, but the Star Trek Three, the resurrection of Kirk, and nobody wants that movie. Yeah, I 100 percent though. I, I'll take a bad end of this movie, like 10 minutes, then like two hours of yeah. No. Oh, and you're I right. remember the actor right. who was supposed who was sort of from what I heard was in the front running to play Khan when they were going to do Khan. His name is Nestor Carbonell. Oh, Google he was him. from Lost. Um Yeah. Google he's, him. he's been in a lot of things. Yeah, he's super hot. Uh, he he, he always <laughs> falsely gets accused of wearing eyeliner, but he just has yeah. really dark. Nah, flashes. he just got them. He got them flashes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I could actually totally <laughs> see that. He would have to get really like pumped up. He would I have think, to get a little bit more ripped because he's kind of a skinny dude. But for I could, the most he, part, the facial everything mm -hmm. like oh i could totally that's that's some great reboot but he's got the right bear there. he's got the bearing and the like regalness that Khan sort of held that benedict cumberbatch didn't invoke uh and like even benedict cumberbatch didn't know he was playing Khan until literally like a month before they started shooting yeah i, I get <laughs> i get that sense i get the sense that like benedict cumberbatch is like a strong enough actor to deliver lines but i get a sense yeah. that he he doesn't feel 
comfortable in that character. You know, every interview I've ever heard where he's talked about that, he's like, "Yeah, I didn't know I was playing Khan until like you know, twenty eight days before he started shooting," and I was like, "What the?" F-? But I was already under contract by the time, so I couldn't be like, "I'm out of here," because he's like, "I would never." He's like, and especially in the light of like you know, the reckoning of Hollywood in terms of sexism and racism. He's like, I never would. I would have walked. I would have fully walked and just taken a full on hit if I oh, felt yeah. like I could have back then. I mean, in 2013, this, that wasn't an option that I, he, I think he felt he could exercise. This movie dodged quite a, a bullet in terms of the timing that it came out. Cause yeah. this is not a movie that, or that casting choice, that would be uh, the Scarlett yeah. Johansson uh, uh, of our time, yeah. you know, that'd have been that Aeon flux. <laughs> yeah, it definitely. The uh, the shell bull- everybody's like, no, this will be not going to do. Watch this. Uh, bull- <laughs> with the great wall. Amazing. The difference that just like eight years can make. Um, <laughs> One one performance that does stand out that I that I actually really like uh, a lot was Peter Weller as uh, yeah. Admiral Marcus. This is Carol's father, which again I think they kind of they kind of dropped the ball a little bit with Carol Marcus in terms of like well, if you knew who she was from Wrath of Khan, like you kind of expected her to kind of stick around and be a bigger part of it. She doesn't have a lot to. Do in this you would movie? think she would be more interesting and a little bit. Well, I mean, this is. I feel like this is another like studio interference type of bullshit because it's like the the second like you know we we meet her and then less than five minutes later she's half naked, and then we don't see anything about her like scientific prowess. Like we get we get a more progressive view of Carol Marcus thirty five years ago than we do eight years ago, and that's kind of gross. <laughs> it's it's strange. It, it it definitely Alice Eve feels like she showed up two months into filming and was just like, "What do you want me to do?" Like, yeah, it didn't seem like she was part of this the whole time. Especially like there there are certain scenes in Into Darkness, and again, like I do like this movie overall, but there are scenes in Into Darkness that feel like odd reshoots like where they go down to the planet to disarm the bomb which is really like a you know a holding stasis for one of con soldiers like that all feels like reshot in someone's like backyard like there's just certain yeah. things about this movie that's just like there's huge spectacle going to chronos and seeing the klingons and it's shot in imax and everything and then you just have this like weird little scene to the side that's just like this looks like it was shot in three hours on a saturday afternoon yeah you know? there's a couple of moments in that movie that feel like that like where you're like when you change this that's why i feel like the triple moment with mccoy is like one of those moments it's it's like, no, there has to be other moments of him with this triple that they cut out for time or for storytelling purposes that then make this other triple moment, which they had to have include, feel more forced. Right. And I think like some of those chrono scenes um, and some of the care, like, and I think pretty much every Carol Marcus scene, except for the one where she says, I'm Carol Marcus, feels like that. Yeah. But again, like her, her dad, Admiral Marcus, Peter Weller, like, that was a great character. That was a great villain. I loved his motivation. That the like, was just. And I think what would have been more interesting for Carol Marcus, like if we're going to do a reboot it here, yeah. is to say that she was working with her dad the entire time, and either we don't encounter her until they get to Kronos, and she's there because she's there to like make sure the bombs go off or whatever, or the torpedoes land that the way they're supposed to, and then she's got a ship nearby or whatever, or we meet her on, or we we meet her earlier. And she's still, but in some kind of way that she's in league with her father and like she meet her earlier and she's in league and she's manipulating Kirk to get on the enterprise to make sure that this thing goes down properly. But to Both make her, but to yeah. make her have this like, daddy, what are you doing? Oh, it's stupid. I don't like it. And it makes her, it totally regresses her from what we know of Carol Marcus from search for back. Yeah. It's, um, <sighs> yeah, the, look, there's there there are certain things in this movie I can't defend. Carol Marcus being one of them, the ending, Triple Blood, I can't uh, defend. But there's a lot of like I love the sequence where they jump or uh, from one ship to the other. Yeah, when they go to the Enterprise to the what is it called? The Vigilant, the Valiant, the Vengeance. 
Vengeance, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's a really cool Star Trek sequence. Something that you just couldn't do back in those old Star Trek movies. Like, the yeah. technology just wasn't available. It's the same thing. It's on, But it also evokes something from the first movie. So it may be like they're repeating themselves when they do the space jump. That's true. Right, right. Uh, certainly, like, upgraded times a billion. But... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I do. I know it's a little cheesy, but I love the Godfather Three homage. The shootout in the um, uh, in the in the Starfleet headquarters, where uh, oh, yeah. ultimately Bruce Greenwood and, dies. And Pike dies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, Pike. Um, I, I, I like all that stuff. Like it's not a perfect movie, uh, by any stretch of the ima imagination. It does fall short of the first one, but I don't think it's like people are like Ugh, into darkness. I'm like, there's still stuff in there. It's worth watching. It's not like, it's it. totally worth watching. And like, like I said, like the, once I knew that there is a reason why the movies are kind of where they are, like there are some creative choices, obviously, but there are also some like forced choices that they had to make if they were going to make a star trek movie at all that i'm like okay i can enjoy it for being its own thing it doesn't have to be part of star trek and that's so, sort of how i've always thought about it and that makes me enjoy all three of them although the third one not my fave <laughs> uh i'm in the same boat and now we're going to talk about 2016's uh star trek beyond now jj abrams not at the helm of this one this is justin lynn from fast mm -hmm. and fury fame I remember this coming out in, and it was kind of the summer of, I call it the summer of disappointment because you had well, Batman V Superman. And you're like, ah, oh, okay. And then there was like, I was really excited for suicide squad. It was like, oh, okay. And then you had ghostbusters, which I liked, but most people are like, okay. Mm -hmm. And independence day. Okay. And that weird hot dog movie with Seth Rogen, that was not funny. So Star Trek is kind of just wedged into the summer where there's just a lot of disappointing movies. I, I remember the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles part two did not do the same business as the first one. All of these sequels are coming out that were just kind of not hitting in the same way that their well, predecessors yeah. did. And then Star Trek Beyond comes out and it's just kind of there. Like, mm -hmm. you no, know, it doesn't. It felt like I saw it and I was like, all right, I guess this is fine and i never thought it's it's easily the least rewatched of these movies for me oh yeah well i mean up until 2020 2016 was our worst year so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was like literally every celebrity that anybody cared about except for betty white died and <laughs> and then we had a bunch of like what is it? i mean like highly anticipated movies that went and were like Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> and Star Trek Beyond was one of them where it was like, it's not terrible. I re I rewatched it actually. Um, maybe about about like not this time last year, but maybe like a month before this time last year, like January of last year is probably the last time I watched it. And I was like, it's not as bad as I remember, but it's still not a great movie. It's okay. It's you know, I'm not it's mad it exists. It just feels to me like, and this is, look, maybe this is me just kind of projecting, but it feels like Justin Lin is embarrassed of Star Trek. This movie feels like it's embarrassed of being a full Star Trek movie, and it feels this, like it's trying to be anything but that. Oh, it feels like it could literally be any established characters in this exact same situation. So this could be a Die Hard movie. It could be another Fast and Furious movie. It could be... You know what I mean? It could be a Lethal Weapon movie. This look could literally be any sort of iconic, canonized characters that we all sort of know, so we don't need any introduction, thrust into a, a, the exact same scenario. You just have to change the location. You, you, you move this movie from, I forgot the name of the planet, but you move this movie from the planet to Compton. You keep Idris Elba, and it's another Lethal Weapon movie. <laughs> Yeah, I, totally. And I think too, like, so it turned me off, like immediately the movie starts and it's like a really stupid gag, which is that these, this alien race that Kirk is negotiating with are like two feet tall. Okay. But then we get on to the enterprise. So Kirk just, you know, he does this whole monologue where he's just like, ah, oh, year three, 
still boring in space. I'm like, this isn't Star Trek's all about like you, you're so you don't want to yeah. be anywhere else, but in space, I get that that's supposed to be his character arc in this movie is coming to that. But I feel like nobody really has an arc in this movie. Like by the end, he's like, no, I don't want to be Admiral. I do want to be on the ship. I'm like, why? There's nothing about what you just went through. That makes me think that you learned some super valuable thing about what you're doing. Yeah, the only thing that it really invokes is maybe he like cares about the people on the on the ship more than he thought. That he doesn't want to leave them, but it's like it's like staying at a job for your coworkers. You hate your job, but you love the like you love the snacks and you like your coworkers. So you stay <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah, Kirk's Kirk's staying on the Enterprise for the snacks. That's now canon in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know they bring in bagels every monday they bring donuts every friday and they get you like thai food on wednesdays or whatever like you stay for <laughs> like the, and this the snacks in the break room are great but I, the only thing that feels like is is that kirk wasn't like if you watch the original series and i and i think that it it that movie deviates the furthest from his personality because kirk was kind of a nerdy scientist for all of his bravado and machismo, although he wasn't the lady killer that people remember him to be. He's not Zap Brannigan by any stretch. If you watch, if you rewatch the original series, he's not like that at all. And that's a total like Bernstein Bears moment for people. He is a nerdy scientist. So it's like space wouldn't bore him. Even if you, all he was doing was like cataloging nebulas, he would not be bored. Yeah, but but that's the thing. It's like, okay, let's just that's say for the sake like of Kirk's argument. But let's just say for the sake of argument, because we've already established that these are different, you know, if this is how you veer off, like I'm okay with these characters going through things that necessarily they didn't deal with in the show. That's fine. My my issue with it is you know, they crash land on this planet and they get separated, which I never love that trope of like, let's just separate everyone out. But yeah, because seems... then it's like the interpersonal relationships is part of the reason why it's interesting in the first place. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, like there's nothing that it's like Kirk's like, basically the way that I read this movie is Kirk's lamenting, like, man, I go on these adventures, but it's the same thing every time. Then he goes on an adventure and somehow at the end is like, Never mind, adventures are cool. Like, that's just not an interesting character arc at yeah. all. And, and I don't know if they just hit a point where they're just like, we don't know how to evolve Kirk, in which case, don't make the third movie Kirk centric. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just say, like, Kirk doesn't necessarily. I feel like there's a there is a trap that sometimes sequel, like sequelitis trap, I guess, that some sequels fall into where it has to always be like a character changing. I don't think characters necessarily need to change that much. I think you need to like, it's more interesting to be like, or the change, but it needs to be more circumstances that change them rather than them just deciding to change. And I think that's where this movie sort of fails is that it feels like that he doesn't, Nothing about the, yeah, I guess you, it's the same thing you're saying. I'm stupid. That's the same thing you're saying. Because <laughs> he, there's nothing about the, 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 that adventure that should have changed him. He doesn't necessarily need to have an arc. Like he could still, why couldn't he just still be able to become a vice admiral after that? Like, yeah, it's did he weird. have it's... to stay on the Enterprise and can, like, or why couldn't just make the, this mission have been their last mission of their five year journey? And then now um, he's a f right. vice admiral because in the original movies, like he does go from admiral back to captain. So why not just become an admiral? Like, why does that have to change? Because we're in the Kelvin universe now and everything has got to be a little bit different. No, because it doesn't have to be. It could be different however the f you want. So just have him become like, all right, now I'm an admiral. Peace, y'all. Bye, Yahura. I also think the hackiest thing that you can do in these Star Trek movies now that has no meaning anymore is destroying the Enterprise. Anytime that they destroy the Enterprise, it's oh. like, this does not have any weight for me anymore because you've done well, it it's so like, many yeah. times. It's like they're killing Kenny at this point. Right. It's like <laughs> you've done, you've destroyed it in like search for Spock. You destroyed it in generations, probably a handful of other things I'm forgetting at the moment, but it's just like, yeah. it doesn't hit as an emotional thing anymore. I'm sorry. It probably only worked that one time. 
Yeah. Now, yeah, it's yeah. They've killed Kenny, and they're like, "Oh my god, you killed the Enterprise!" <laughs> and just <laughs> I, I don't know, just like driving around like on the motorcycles. I was like, "Is this like Cirque du Soleil? Why are we not in space?" Oh, the hologram. Well, that's full on. Like that's why I said, like it feels like it could have been. It could have been another Fast and the Furious movie. And I think that was a lot of like critics' problems, and I think it was a lot of the audience problems with that movie. Is that you could have literally dropped. That scenario had nothing to do with Star Trek. It had everything to do with basic action tropes. I, I mean, the other like travesty. And, then, and what's his name? Co-wrote it. Um, Simon Pegg. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, he had a big hand in this, which is not surprising he, that his character gets a lot more to do in this yeah. film. <laughs> and he gets and he gets to hang out with the bitch the whole time. I wonder what that was about. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, if you're, if you're gonna write yourself apart, you know, mm -hmm. um, the other travesty of this Rick Berman of you, Scott <laughs> Simon Pig. For those of you Star Trek super nerds out there, know that Rick Berman is <laughs> the other travesty of this movie to me is you have, especially at that time, like this emerging like superstar in Idris Elba. And yeah. you just hide him in 25 no. pounds of makeup. You like, hide unrecognizable. the hottest black man to come along since Denzel Washington in 1987. And you put him under eight hours of makeup is wrong. And then when you finally do show his face, he's still under about three hours of makeup. <laughs> yeah, it's distorted. And I, for the life of me, could yeah. not, especially that last fight, I was like, I have no idea what you're saying. Like, yeah. I, I can't understand a word I, that you're saying. The first time I saw that movie, didn't realize it was Idris Elba until they revealed part of his face, his actual face. And I was like, this was like, I didn't, I hadn't fought because I make a point when it's a movie, I really anticipate. I, like I'm, I'm all about spoilers. I love spoilers. I don't give a fuck about spoilers like 98% of the time. But if it's a movie I highly anticipate or a show I highly anticipate, I do. I make an effort to avoid spoilers without being a dick about it and telling other people they need to stop putting spoilers up. I know how to stay off social media for a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went in not knowing that it was Idris Elba. And I did not realize it was Idris Elba until they showed his face. And I was like, what the f was the point of casting him? Yeah. I mean, especially too, it's like if he's going to be unrecognizable and he's going to do like this, this voice where like, I can't yeah. understand the words that are coming it out of his mouth. It wasn't really his voice and he doesn't have a particularly distinctive voice to begin with. It's like, what's the point? He doesn't yeah. have a distinctive voice. Like he has a distinctive look, like the way he looks is interesting and especially his eyes and mouth area are distinctive. Like the way he expresses himself when he's acting with his face. And it's like they covered both of those things all the way up with contacts and prosthetics. Like what was the point? That makes no sense. He would have made a great other villainous captain or if they had made him a different species, a Romulan or a Vulcan or even a Bolian where he would have been blue, but she still would have been able to tell who he was. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was, it was a lot of like strange decisions i mean look this movie is not devoid of anything that i liked i like you know what? if they had flipped and idris elba had been con and bandit cumberbatch had been i forgot the name of his character in beyond um, that would because if bandit crawl. Cumberbatch, crawl bandit cumberbatch would have made a great call and it just would have made a great con and it would have been a a slightly more racially sensitive although not at not totally but slightly and b would have made more sense from a pure casting standpoint because Benedict Cumberbatch has a distinctive enough voice that certain people would have been like, "That's that Benedict," because it's like you know. <laughs> that's, that's that's the other thing, by the way. <laughs> that's so hacky about like this kind of a like a reveal that he he was Captain Edison before, but mm. it's just like well. Okay, so he he became you know he used alien technology to prolong his life and it kind of turned him into this thing. Why does he change his name? Is it's literally just so you can have this moment where you're like, oh, that actually is this other guy. Like, there's no point for him to have yeah. two names. You know, like that's dumb. And that's it's not dumb. like Edison is so like it's a con it's a common kind of to us in our mind because of history, but it's not a super uncommon name. There are other people with the last name Edison. Yeah, that, like, or if it's super in the future, they're like, huh, I bet you there's a lot of people with the last name Edison because you know, either they changed the name to be Edison or is Edison's descendants. Oh, that's interesting. He, you know what I mean? 
It wouldn't have been, been on people's minds to be like Edison. And then all of a sudden, here comes this dude as Edison. And you're like, oh, my God. Like, so, it did, yeah, it didn't need to be changed. That's also like, that's why Beyond is the dumbest of the three by far. It's unfortunate that this is the, you know, Anton Yelchin sadly passed away in a tragic accident. And this Which was, I think about far too often. It's, it was, it was one of those things where this, the besides the point, but you know, he, he, he died because his car, there was something wrong with it and it crushed him. Yeah. Um, and I had just gotten a notice like two weeks earlier that there was some recall thing on my car. I was like, yeah, 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 I'll get to it. And then as soon as that happened, I was like, I'm taking this in tomorrow. Like mm-hmm. it just it like scared me to the point where I was just like, it's just one of those things where you never expect someone like, you know, like someone so young to mm-hmm. have something like that happen. And it, it, even though I don't like this movie very much, uh, it does make me sad that, you know, even if they do make another movie with this cast, which is not looking very likely anymore, mm-hmm. um, that this was it, that they would have to either, you know, write that character out or kind of leave it behind. Yeah. Or recast it. Like, and you're just going to be like, uh-huh. uh, yeah, I just wouldn't do that. You know? Yeah. I always think about that accident because like where Ed and I live, um, it's we don't we have a gate where our car is parked, but it's not an automated gate. So a lot of times, like Ed will, if I'm driving or if he's driving, whatever, whoever, uh, and we take the car. We only have one car between us because we're um, that so one of us will come and do the gate. So if we're parking, coming back in, and we park the car, the person who's locking the gate is like behind the car, like between the car and the gate. And every time I like, it comes to my mind literally every time. I'm like, so I always sit in the car with like my foot on the brake, even when the key is out of the ignition to like wait until he's not behind the car anymore before I like get out of the car. Yeah. It's just like the, the most, you know, the saddest freak accident that just kind of, you know, it's, it, it, and you know, I do wonder like if that kind of put a somber kind of feel on this movie before, you know, you even got to it, you know, like, I feel like movies where an actor dies, before it's finished most of the time it's sort of with the energy of the movie and like the everything else about it is tainted i would say like the only thing only movie i can think of in recent memory that wasn't kind of like that is um the dark knight Mm -hmm. but like every other movie whether it was meant to be a bad movie like raul julia's last movie being street fighter poor thing or you know or (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or Star Trek Beyond. It's like any movie where like an actor, especially if a, a major character, like a, a ma- an actor who plays a major character dies before the movie is com- fully completed or before it's released even, it always like taints the energy of the movie a little bit. And I feel like it always affects like how well it does. Yeah, there was, it definitely was still even fresh. Even good movies, yeah. He had passed away uh, June 16th and this movie came out at the end of July. So it was, Mm. it wasn't like, you know, God rest his soul. It was like Heath Ledger died in January and that movie came out in July. So there was a little bit of time to kind of process what had happened with Anton Yelchin. It was just like, he passed away so tragically, so suddenly. And then all of a sudden this movie comes out and you're just like, I don't know. It, it definitely had a weird energy. And then when you start to watch the movie, like I said, like the first monologue from Kirk is such a downer that it just kind of like, I go to a Star Trek movie because it's like, Star Trek is such an inspiring kind of like yeah. makes you feel good. And like, I just walked in and it's like, man, I already feel like crap. And this just started like five minutes ago, you know? Yeah. Or you like, I feel like the same thing, like maybe like you know, with um, Chadwick Boseman with like the Five Bloods and Ma Rainey's. It's like yeah. both of the, but both of those movies are also downer movies. I haven't been able to bring myself to watch them because I'm like, I don't want to watch. And he's like clearly not well in the both of those movies. I like, mean, now that you know, like what's up, you know, it's hard to. If I'd yeah. watched those movies a year ago, I probably wouldn't. I would have been like, he's real skinny. That's weird. But I wouldn't have like, but now that I know that what, like, oh, he's dying of cancer. Now I can't watch him. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just, <laughs> there's a lot of like, it's, it's always tough when like a real world thing affects like a movie like that, mm. but. Uh, I'll watch him if, eventually, but. Yeah. Even that aside, I just think Star Trek Beyond just kind of felt like, you know, that first movie was just like, you know, taking a Red Bull. It was like, whoa. And I feel like by the third one, it had completely worn off and you had kind of that Red Bull hangover. And I'm, I'm fine leaving it where it is. I don't, you know, 
as of right now, you know, I know that there's a new movie coming out and, and they have Kalinda Vasquez who uh, was, who's been uh, associated with Star Trek discovery. Uh, she's going to write a new Star Trek film. I don't know if it's yeah. going to be with this crew or not. Maybe, maybe don't, maybe just kind of leave this where it is. Oh, I mean, I, I'm all for letting people like keep, keep plugging if that's what you want to do. I'm not going to begrudge you that. I, I don't, I'm not going to hate on like if they try to make another one, it's not going to bother. Like, it's, I, I might be annoyed to some degree, but at the same point, I might be like, eh, well, you know, it doesn't distract, detract from my enjoyment of all of the original sh- movies and shows and the new Trek that they like to call it with the NU, which I hate. Um, mm-hmm. That I hate calling it New Trek with an NU, like it's some sort of metal band from the early two thousands. <laughs> uh, but that. <laughs> but I mean, I, at this point, I would almost rather it, them do kind of like a reboot it where they do Star Trek: The Next Generation, but with like the Kelvin that, Next Gen. You know, now a Kelvin Universe Next Generation would be my I- ideal. That would be a Kelvin Universe like Next Generation on, like so TNG, DS Nine, Voyager. If they even smash those all together, I would be on board for that. Um, I'm on board for them bringing in characters from the other old, like, like canon Trek, as the, as the legalese call them, into the Picard and Discovery series. Like, supposedly, Janeway is going to make an appearance in Picard and Guinan as well. And I like that idea. So if they did a TNG Kelvin universe and they... And maybe the crews get mixed up, so it's it's Picard, but Cisco is his first officer or something. I would, I would love a, like anything like that. You know, it's it's kind of funny, you know, just kind of to bring this all around to a to a close. It's just you know, last week with Ron, we talked Star Wars: Revenge of the Sith, and, mm-hmm. and Star Wars is kind of in the same situation right now that Star Trek is in, which is the movies kind of left people a little sour or a little burnt out. And now they're both kind of finding these new lives on streaming services. You know, I think Star Trek has probably, this is, you know, the most with lower decks, Picard and discovery all going at the same time. Like this is kind of the most simultaneous Trek activity that there's been since the old days of like, Voyager and Space Nine and all that. Yeah, since like, yeah, 95 or 96 is the last time we've had this many Star Trek shows on at the same time. And Lower Decks, I think, is what they're doing to give the fan service to, like, let people feel like, uh, we remember, we remember (laughs) what it was like. Let's everybody settle down. (laughs) You know, and so, and I think they're going to like expand that animated universe is what I've heard as well. Yeah. Uh, they're just like star Wars, just like Batman, there's kind of something for everyone with star Trek. I now, even though I was a real, you know, butthole about it in 2009, I now appreciate that there is a star Trek movie that my wife will actually watch with me and won't be like, okay, I'm going in the other room. Um, you know, it exists. <laughs> I got to go with some of my friends who would never step foot or never watch any sort of Star Trek thing. Like we went and saw Star Trek together. And even if it wasn't my all time favorite Star Trek, like I appreciate that the Kelvin trilogy does what I always try to bring to the rebooted show, which is how do we make new fans The you know, like we've Mm -hmm. already super served the hardcore fans. How do we make new fans of these things? And I think this trilogy, give or take, uh, did a really good job of making fans, existing fans happy, and it made a whole lot of new ones. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, there, there's always going to be fans who hate everything. Like, I'm in Star Trek shit posting on Facebook, and there are Star Trek, fan, Star Trek fans in there who literally hate everything Star Trek. And it's like, how are you a Star Trek fan if you cannot stand anything about Star Trek? It makes no sense. But, and like, and not even in a posting way, they were just like, well, you know, and like, there's always one who's like, Kirk is a misogynist. And you're like, if you watch the show, he's not really. And then they're like, a new trick is, you know, just, he just cries all the time. Well, if you watch the show, it actually makes sense. And you know, you're, you're being crazy. Uh, 2009 <laughs> trick is an abomination. Well, you know what? If you calm down, <laughs> everybody, you calm don't down. have to like everything, but you don't have to hate everything either. 
And that's sort of how I feel about a lot of things. I, I think that's a great, uh, I'm putting that on my tombstone. <laughs> he didn't like everything, but he didn't hate everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Star Trek, the Kelvin trilogy timeline. Clee. I'm so happy that we finally got to talk Star Trek. Uh, it was a joy. Is my hot take hot enough? It's not uh, that bad. I, I, I had to I had to keep my desk fan on the entire time because it is so hot in here. Uh, thank you so much for for joining me, and thank you guys for listening. And one way or another, I will see you guys next week.